uh, private not-for-profit organization focuses primarily with young people that are in the child welfare system uh, or juvenile justice system uh, or in danger of going into the child welfare or juvenile justice system. Um, you know, we, we really believe um, that it's best for children to stay with their families if at all possible, uh, although we do have residential programs, uh, residential treatment programs, we have therapy to foster care programs, we have group homes, uh, we, we provide transitional living as well as intensive in-home services. Uh, we also in Tennessee, just in Tennessee, have an adoption program and a statewide crisis program. We operate in 10 states in the District of Columbia. We have 64 locations, about 2,300 staff, serve about 17,000 young people a day. Uh, you know, our real focus is help uh, work with states and to help transform their child welfare system uh, and where, where we can focus more on keeping children and families together. And if children do have to be removed from their family, uh, to help try to return those young people home as quickly as possible. Well, most governments are strapped by a few things. One is obviously economic challenges you know, these days and times. Overwhelming number of young people in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems um, that often stay there a very long time. Uh, and also, they don't get very good outcomes. They know that their recidivism rates are terrible. That the kids often come back into care. Uh, and there's often crisis in the child welfare system in our own community. So what we do is we try to work with the, the lead officials in the state and try to help identify what their key problems and challenges are and, and see really if our programs and services can, can, can match some of their challenges and hopefully we all have the same goals of helping children and families live successfully in the community in a, in a more natural environment versus an institutional uh, type environment. But they do have to be an institutional type care or foster care. It's a good setting. Uh, it's appropriate for that young person's needs but there's also a strategy and a plan trying to return that young, people, young person home or find them a new home as quickly as possible. At 24, you know, I hadn't been out in the world too much. Uh, I, mean, I had great parents. I grew up, uh, you know, went to Catholic schools, elementary schools, high schools, had a younger brother, older brother, great family. I mean, it was a Cleaver family, so to speak. I mean, we had, you know, scouts and sports and very active. Um, but I, I had a, the first program I went to work for when I was 18 at Tall Trees Youth Guidance School. I had a very, very good uh, man that ran the program. His name was Bill Key, uh, a very good leader. Uh, you know, he was way ahead of his times in her thinking about how to help young people. Then I went to work at juvenile court for five and a half years after that, from, you know, 19 to 24. Another very, very strong juvenile cut court judge there. So I had an opportunity to watch two men work that, uh, you know, there were things I didn't like as well, but there were a lot of things I liked. So I had really two people that I could model my early years after. Uh, but then after that, I, when I began reading in my late 20s, early 30s, I really was drawn to some people, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa. I mean, you look at their stories, you read their stories, you read their past, you look at the years of commitment. It wasn't overnight. It was all based on sacrifice and vision and bringing people along the way. I love them. I mean, I love reading their stories. It's been quite some time. But then also, as I've worked in our organization, I've had some fantastic chairman of boards and board members, a man named Jim Pickle, a man named Spence Wilson, uh, my current chair of the board, Mike Bruns, that have been really strong, you know, men and strong leaders and it really provided me a lot of support. I read a lot, you know, obviously I love Jim Collins, Ram Sharon, Peter Drucker, you know, I, I read, you know, a tons of, of books and, and try to find pieces from all those people or, or their data or their research or their experiences or their stories about other organizations and I try to take that and bring it to these villages. But I also really work hard at every one of our quarterly meetings in the back of the room where all these books I've read over the years and inspire, encourage our people to read and, and learn you know, new and different ways to do things better and more effectively and more efficiently. You know, I think a lot of people come to work at youth villages, you know, right out of undergraduate, graduate school. They think they know what they want to do. You know, it's, it's hard to really know what you want to do. And I think once they kind of get into our work and see that they can really make a difference, that, you know, they're not just, uh, you know, somebody that's graduated from college, they're, they're, they're a person that can make a difference in the life of a young person, the life of a family. And I think when they uh, get to, get, you know, hopefully have a good experience with their team they work with, with their supervisor, the person that, that leads the organization, and hopefully, you know, after, you know, I usually say if you're not excited about this place in seven or eight months, it's probably not the best place for you. But that's our job. Our job is to get them excited about it and give them an opportunity to maybe have some challenges along the way, but also be able to pick themselves up and be successful. So, you know, 
Uh, I, I mean, I think we probably hire the same kind of people everybody else hires. I mean, I wish we had a market on hiring the best people. We, we, we try to hire the best people. But I don't, you know, people all start out a little rough around the edges. I think we get better over time. The awkward part about that is, you know, we thought the silver bullet was residential treatment. I remember from 1980 to, to 1994, that's primarily what we did. We did start foster care a little bit in the early 90s, but that was what we did. We were selling that. We were raising money. We were building buildings. You know, we convinced government officials and referral sources to send us their kids and work with families. And we basically, you know, had to, that was a difficult time. I mean, it wasn't a difficult, it was an exciting time, but in my head the whole time I'm saying, at what point am I going to admit this publicly that I was wrong? <clears throat> now, I'd been doing this 20 years since, you know, in 1993, because I started in 73. Even when I was a probation officer at Juma Court, my focus was try to get kids in residential treatment programs. And that was my focus, to get those kids in those programs. So, you know, it was, it, you know, it took some, you know, some convincing inside my head and some, some sleepless nights and a lot of writing and a lot of reading. And, uh, and but when we decided to make the change, I mean, it came all out. We started over. We rewrote every job description, every policy and procedure, mission and values, met with every staff. We lost some staff during that period of time because their belief system was still, they were in the business of raising other people's children. So we lost some staff. That was tough. But we said, you can't stay. If your heart says one thing, just just because we're seeing your head shake that way, if it's not, if your heart's not shaking that way too, it doesn't work. And it didn't work for some of those people. That was that was a challenge. I think, I think with scaling, you first have to have a strategy. You've got to make sure that um, you understand the conditions of the place where you're going to scale. We have a clear process. It's several pages of we're assessing the conditions in a new, a new community. You know, does that community uh, believe that children are raised best by their families? Is the government consistent with that belief? Are you going to be able to get referrals? What are the rules and regulations? Uh, are you, can you raise money in that community? Can you acquire, can you find high quality people to work in this environment? I mean, there's a lot of questions that you have to ask yourself before you consider a new community. But the most important question is who's going to lead that new office? Who's going to lead that new state charge? And, and, and then do we have the resource to support that person, not just the financial resources? You know, how long is it going to take us to open office, get information technology, get the phone system in, provide the training for the new staff? There's a lot of pieces to that. Then build the marketing that you have to have a strategy and a plan. And so we've had some missteps along the way, and we've learned from those, and we're trying to get better each time. But, you know, you, you have to have a strategy, a plan, and stick with it. And, and we do have challenges. Bring the group back together, solve a problem, and keep moving forward. But, um, you know, that, that's it. And then you have to monitor the outcome. You want to monitor your services along the way. And there's certain key indicators where the things are not going well. You're not getting paid. You're not getting referrals. You have a lot of staff turnover, you know, a lot of disruptions in the program with the kids. I mean, there's a lot of indicators that say slow down. You know, we've got some problems here. So we're constantly monitoring a number of components. I mean, every day, some and some every week and some every month along the way to, to know if it's working or if it's not working. Yeah, so that, that's critical. And we also, like I said, we hire from within. All the people that begin new areas uh, of a country, in the country, we won't go there unless we have a key person that really is prepared to lead that program. They have the necessary training for startups. Startups are a lot harder than just running a day-to-day -day program. And you know, they're willing to make those level of sacrifices. Yeah. You know, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the goals have changed. I mean, you know, much more of a focus now is on uh, business development, on uh, on developing leadership, because we've got we're having, we're growing at a rate. You know, we've been going about fifteen to sixteen, seventeen percent a year. You know, you've got you're doubling every you know four to five years. You've got to have a leadership pipeline. A much greater focus on policy, national and local policy, branding. A much greater focus on branding, which we really never focus that much on a real process to evaluate possible mergers and acquisitions as a key strategy, possibly. So, yeah, I mean, the, the organiz I mean, the, the philosophy and the mission all stay consistent, but when it comes to the strategies to impact your organization, yeah, it's changed dramatically. I mean, I never dreamed we'd ever have a lobbyist or being working on the Hill, you know, or, or, or really focusing on trying to brand our organization and for people to know who we are. That was not our focus years ago. It was really focused on providing good services for kids. But we're finding to provide good services for kids you have to have the, the, the resources, which often come from the government, but you also, people have to know who you are. The, the biggest challenge is, is getting, I mean, I've had hundreds of meetings with government officials to get them to even be open to the idea of serving a young person in the community with their family versus um, 
versus uh, put them in institutional care or residential foster care. That I mean, I remember this was years ago meeting with a guy, and he was probably 10 or 15 years older than me, and we'd met three or four times in the course of about a month and a half. And I said, you know, um, every week I'm going to be here to meet with you until we are able to get a contract. And I said, and we're relatively young. And I was sitting here with Lee Roan, who's younger than I was, and we were there every week until he finally got the boot and they brought somebody else in. And, and that it takes a degree of persistence and patience. And it's got to be a loving degree of persistence and patience. It can't be going there, hitting them over the head, saying, you got to do this. You know, we, you know, we want, you know, we've got to help, we want to help you do this together. But, uh, that is the most frustrating part. I mean, just to get people to change the way they think and think that, and, and even be open to it sometimes. And we're meeting with some states now that they're not even, they have terrible financial problems, a terrible child welfare system, a lawsuit, but they're not even open to making this change, and it's so frustrating. You, you leave there and just wanna, you know, just hit your head against the wall. Yeah. You know? The real, the most important, there's one metric that, w w that has to be measured. It's what happens after a young person leaves your program. The key metric is one year. Now, we, we do track children, not just one year, but we also track them at two year, but the data is almost the same at one year and two year. That metric is the key data. It says, how is that young person doing one year after they left? Because usually if you can get a family through a crisis at a difficult time and you provide the necessary skills and support that they need to, to carry on with, if after one year that family's doing good, you got a pretty good chance. That's the key metric. We, we know that drives everything we do. Now, there's hundreds of metrics that fold up to, 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 to make uh, the programs and the services sufficient enough for that metric is 80% plus. And, and we have a lot of indicators that we measure as we're rolling that up. And we know that there are certain indicators that can go wrong that are going to mess that up. And, and we, we have a pretty good idea what most of those are. Not all of them. We're trying to explore that now. But, uh, but if there's something in the, in the, in the kind of the, the, the indicator process along the way that, that is, is, is messed up, uh, turnover with staff, uh, bad training program, uh, bad clinical supervision. We know there's some things that you're not going to get that 83 percent success rate, success rate, or kids moving in and out of several different programs in the course of your program. You know, we know we know you know we're not going to be able to achieve that goal. So that's that's the primary metric we look at. Yeah. You know, uh, we would love we would love to see youth villages be the organization that anytime a state has problems or the federal government is looking at policy issues or program service issues or outcome data and measurement processes, they would say give us a call and know that we're, we're an organization that has data, that has proven outcomes, have proven programs. We're still learning, got a lot to learn, but we can help them. I mean, we want to be an organization that if a state is serious about transforming their, transforming their, their, their system and improving their system, they'll give us a call. Uh, we want to, and, and we're probably going to be in a lot of those states anyway, but we really want to go deep in probably a handful of states and provide a continuum of services, not just in-home services, because we think you can better impact probably five or six states versus going and have a small impact on 30 or 40 states. Uh, we're right now in the middle of our business planning and hopefully we'll be able to share more specifically what that strategy will look like in a few months. Uh, but we do know that there's gotta be changes on Capitol Hill for us to have a chance. If there are not significant changes on the Hill and it's not Democrat or Republican changes, it's philosophical changes and taking resources from bad, services and bad programs and put them into good services and good programs. You know, that has to be done. And there has to be a way to measure the outcome of every services the state provides um, or it, it will just, it will be a disaster.